white clock. Don't go when you're doing the old stage song. Yeah, yeah. Nice to put my legend. Um, Keep going. Sorry, I'm going to do two mics at the end of the day because we've had a couple of years. Um, so yeah, we have to pass it. Just try and do it that now, rather than down. Try not to spill the audio like last year. Okay. Absolutely not of that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you look good, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good? Wow. I've been real with Guys, can we try and move in if possible? Oh, the people see it. Oh, it's too late now. We <laughs> have to sort ourselves out. Oh, hey. Yeah, no worries. That's fine. Let's that one for now. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. The first question is, what the hell is Peter Clark doing asking the questions? Um, because obviously I'm, I'm more used to be on the, being on the receiving end. And it actually turns out that in the competition that we had this morning before we started, I'm the nearest looking to, <laughs> to Fiona Bruce. So. <laughs> so welcome to question time from Kenilworth. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we also did another survey this morning. Um, where we asked if any of the people on the stage had actually had sex in the shower. And one of them said yes, and the other four of us said we haven't actually been to prison yet. So, <laughs> enough of that. So to business. I'm, I'm going to ask the guys one by one, uh, just to introduce themselves briefly. I, I'm sure there, there are one, certainly one or two up here that need no introduction whatsoever, but for the sake of formality, I'll get the guys to just introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they've done, um, just in case you're not familiar. Um, and then we'll get down to the questions. I'm going to try and do this a little bit more interactively this year, and I'll ask a question, and then I'll ask you guys um, to ask a question. Um, I would say think about your questions. Um, we'll try not make it 90 questions for Dr. Hubbard. <laughs> that we're actually got questions that can be panel wide if we can. I know the temptation is great to do it, um, and, and believe me, irrespective of what you've been taught all the time you've been growing up, there are such things as stupid questions. <laughs> and uh, if you do, I won't let them pass out. So, forewarned is forearmed. Um, let's open with this first gentleman to my left. Hello, uh, my name is Barry Leach. Um, worked on just over 400 video games. Uh, you probably remember Lotus 2, uh, maybe Rush 2, Rush 2049, Gauntlet Dark Legacy, Gauntlet Legends, and Horizon Chase Turbo and Horizon Chase 2. Hi, I'm Jason Whiteley, and I'm responsible for EA soundtracks from 91 to 96. One of my famous soundtracks that you may know is Desert Strike for the Amiga. I'm Rob, I wrote um, C64 and um, Nintendo and Spectrum and Keep going. <laughs> Genesis and um, Sony um, thingy. <laughs> Dreadful IBM PC Tandy 1000 and uh, 3DO and a few others. Can't follow that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mike. I used to work for Zygnosis. The end. <laughs> no, really. um, so I worked from I did a few games before Psygnosis but I worked from Psygnosis throughout the 90s into the Playstation era and you know all the wipeouts and things like that as well as a bunch of Amiga stuff uh, while I was there I worked on most of the games that we did in some capacity or other generally audio obviously but uh, yeah it was a bit uh, bit of a everyone hands on in the early days so I did a bit of everything there uh, back then and uh, since then, yeah, still in the game industry. Thank you, Mike. 
So hopefully this format of kind of kicking the questions around and getting some bounce into it will work. If it doesn't work, at some point I'll ask somebody with a mobile phone to ring the RSPCA and just say that there's an interviewer at the Holiday Inn flogging a dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully it will work. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go kind of back to the past for, for my opening question. Um, and the common question that gets absolutely battered to death is how did you get into 1964? <laughs> in fact, let's just do a quick. So if you have a connection, or you're just a real big fan of the C64. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if the same applies to the Amiga. Okay. And anything else. <laughs> <coughs> you're a bunch of perverts, really, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, only question. So to all of you in turn. Um, going before that crucial question of how did you get started, before you ever got near writing music for computer games, what happened in your early life? What were the ingredients that basically made you think, that made you think you were qualified? When the trigger came and it was like, I'm going to write music for computer games. So what were the, what were the ingredients in Persona's probably young childhood, um, and for others maybe a little bit older, although I know Rob started young as well. But tell, tell me what you did that you think con then contributed. What were those things that were inside you that basically said to you, I want to go, I want to go and do that, I want to go and write music for computer games? Okay, well, for me it was basically uh, laziness. Um, <laughs> my grandmother used to play church organ, and so she had this big Bon Tempe or organ in her living room. And you could go there and just press a button. Remember those things? It would start the, the bossa nova drum beat playing. You could hold the chord down. It would play the chords for you in time with the music. And so, I mean, that was my first love of playing music. And from there, once you've got some chord progressions, we can play another note on top of it. And you've got a melody, a tune. Well, uh, it started off as a punishment for me because I didn't want to do martial arts like the my older two brothers, and my dad thought it would be a good idea to send me to do piano lessons. So that was my punishment. He now, he now likes to take credit for everything I have. <laughs> so I used to sit there and copy the soundtracks uh, to programs like Black Beauty, Doctor Who, and be inspired by people like that. So that was my beginning journey. And that's what made me feel like I could do it. And I was inspired by this guy. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> so yeah, that was me. Okay, strap in. <laughs> what, was, what was the question? <laughs> so before you got anywhere near a Spectrum or a C64 or anything, what were the ingredients in your life earlier than that, quite a few of which I know, um, that then kind of equipped you? that gave you the, the, the necessary ingredients to then go on and do computer music? Um, hallucinogenic drugs, I think. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, clearly, is that it? How are you going? Yeah. <laughs> go, Mike, go. I don't have anything so amusing. Um, it's literally thing on spring. Because um, I was, God, what? I must have been 10 or 11 years old. And um, it was so good that I recorded it onto tape and took it into school to show people how amazing it was. And one of my mates, I remember him taking it and going, oh my God, he was running around the playground, play, playing thing on the spring, forcing people to appreciate its brilliance. Now, obviously, I was 10 or 11 years old, so I couldn't do anything like that. But I was so into music uh, that... But I couldn't program, so I couldn't do any Commodore 64 stuff. But when the Amiga came about, and it had pre-prepared tools, mm -hmm. that became my outlet. And so I just started doing music and nothing else. And then it got to the point where I play games, and I think, I can do better music yeah, than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like then, it, like it. So that was my target. So that's what cool. It so if we're going to, I think what I'll do is I'll get you to take this mic off me, Faith, and I'll throw it open. And if somebody's got a well thought out question, <laughs> please. Look at your audience. I know, I know. 
Yeah, you can throw your hand up and, uh, and Faith will, will, will run and get your question. It's a knockout, it's a knockout. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to James, you mentioned about um, um, piano and basically composers of theme tunes and stuff. So that intrigued me. So, I mean, obviously with soundtracks, you've got Enio Morricone, <coughs> Jerry Goldsmith, you know, big ones. What would therefore be your favorite composer and uh, theme from that composer? Uh, very good question. Hard one to answer. Uh, let's see. It's going to be, okay. Um, it would be Patrick Doyle's soundtrack to Thor. Yeah, great, great, great uh, pieces of music. Patrick Doyle. Hands, where's the hands? Right, I'm not promising well thought out, but it's a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, do you guys have current music projects that aren't related to games? And where can we check them out? I'm afraid I'm going to have to ban that question. Oh, on the ground so that it may crop up in a little while. Oh, well, <laughs> works for me. <laughs> okay, well, I, I can be sure I'm, I'm working at Pine now doing film scores, and I, I can't say the project right now. But, yeah. Do you think you'd be as creative as you are now if you'd started on platforms? more sophisticated than say three channels and that's it I think definitely I mean it, it was such a huge limitation at the time but it, it forced you to focus <coughs> on what was important at the time which was melody and trying to squeeze in as much of a backing arrangement as you could I mean these days you've got you can have any sound imaginable I mean those days you used to have to battle just to get anything that sounded anything like a snare drum <laughs> Go on, what was the question? <laughs> if you'd had far more sophisticated tools when you started, what do you think? In fact, repeat the question. <laughs> Again, I don't paraphrase you. Would you be as creative now as you, as you are if you hadn't have had to deal with incredibly restrictive hardware? Um, you know, I think it was just a case of it is what it is, really. You know, I mean, sometimes you basically had worse things than a C64. Like if you did IBM stuff, you had a PC beep and, you know, um, a Covox box or something. And, um, you know, you just basically have to try to make use of what you've got. Um, um, and then if you, you know, later on, if you can score for an orchestra, then, you, you know, you basically adapt to um, learning the trade and getting stuck in. So I don't think, the, don't think anything kind of influences anything one way or another, really. Bollocks. <laughs> 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 no, for me, um, it is less the limitation, but the tools available and the basis for comparison. So, with that limitation, the only thing you have to compare yourself against is the other things that are equally limited. So, you're not comparing yourself to whatever was in the charts at the time. You can do something in an hour, and it will potentially sound as good as all of the rest of the stuff done within those limitations. Now obviously, some people are a lot better at it than others. Um, but nevertheless, it, that was something which I think was important because it didn't. I didn't get bogged down in trying to make things sound perfect. They just had to sound as good as everything else, which, because everything was so limited, you didn't have to really put that much work in. You don't have to spend ages EQing stuff. You don't have to get your reverbs just right. You just throw the samples in, put your sounds in, and that's it. And that means you can work very, very quickly. And in my case, that meant that I could do many, many tunes in a very short space of time, which rapidly accelerated my uh, composition skills. And so that was important on that basis. But I don't think it was the limitation itself. It was more the, as I say, the, the, the fact that 
there wasn't anything really to compare it to. I didn't have to compare it to, to good things. I could do rubbish stuff, and in my mind, it sounded amazing, and that just kept kept the loop going. I think you keep that mic, and I'll, we'll all use this one a bit. Um, so, I've been moved into com composing, arranging, computer tunes. Yeah. Um, when you think back now, <coughs> from when you started to where you are now, what would you consider to be your best, most enjoyable period? And a little bit of detail why you think it's your most, your best, most enjoyable period. Um, in, in, and obviously, pick as you will. I think for me, the the early 90s, the very, between 90 and 92, um, I'd finally learned how to compose a piece of music that didn't completely suck. So, uh, I, I, and the games that Gremlin were producing at the time, you know, Lotus, Supercar, Switchblade, they were all great games and it, it, I just got lucky uh, in that period, I think. That was definitely the most enjoyable time. Although the pay could have been a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Barry. I think the mid-90s was um, my most creative period. And I think a lot of artists do have a window where they're at their most creative and then they kind of sometimes ebb out towards the uh, late part of their career. So for me, yeah, mid-90s, I'd say, was the uh, most creative time. Well, this is a really easy question for me. It's, it's, it's the Commodore by a mile Whoa. from 1982 to 1988. It's absolute no-brainer because it was such a it was such a fantastic time. It was like an acid trip, man. It was. <laughs> it was such an innovative time, and the whole you know scene kind of evolved with the demo scene. And um, for for the creative types, it was complete wild west sense of freedom about what we were doing, and um, the community grew, and it was such an absolute ball. We all worked like stupid hours, but it was so much fun that, you know, all the rest of it, like, pales into its significance. So I don't go back that far, so <laughs> it's got to be early 90s again. Um, yeah, because when I, when I actually started, not in the game industry, but when I actually worked at Cygnosis, it was so good that I couldn't wait for the weekend to end so I could go back into work. Wow. That, that, that's what it was like. <laughs> It was amazing. I was just working with all these amazing people. We were doing brilliant games, and I just loved it. It was, it was fantastic. I feel we're maybe getting one or two more narcotic references than we necessarily want to. But <laughs> there any young people in don't listen to Dr. Hubbard. <laughs> don't worry, he isn't the kind of doctor who has access to drugs. So. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a controversial I'm one. Not now. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a question. It's a horrible question, but I really want you to be honest about it, okay? So another question that gets battered to death is what's your favourite piece of music that you wrote? <laughs> yeah. It, hundreds of times. I'm gonna go the other way. In your own opinion, what's your worst tune? Yeah. <laughs> Let's be controversial. And it may not necessarily be the one that you received the harshest criticism for, just in your own opinion. What do you think? Oh, the look of that face. <laughs> the one that I wish I hadn't done was the bloody chicken song. <laughs> Some of the people here on stage aren't exactly innocent of on that one. But yeah, most of my early Commodore 64 stuff was rubbish, but... That, yeah, is that the one that stands out? Yeah, yeah the yeah. chicken song. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Jason. Oh, it was one of uh, one of my soundtracks for uh, Road Rash for the Amiga, and it was because the limitation was so small. I didn't have much memory to play with to, to put the track together. I was supposed to argue with the programmers as to to get more space, and then the artists would want to take their big chunk. Um, so I was left with something like I don't know twelve k. And, um, as much as that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. I mean, that's a lot, and I know you can do some magic with that, but for me, it was a nightmare. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I did a tennis game on the Sega. It was pretty dreadful. Um, 
not many people know about that. And, um, <laughs> um, there was a couple of things on the C64 weren't very good. Eyeball was pretty crap. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then um, there was, uh, I can't remember, there was something else I did that wasn't very good, but it'll come to us. Um, but I definitely do not endorse the use of drugs, so... <laughs> So please take that with a with, please take that with a pinch of salt because I I I'm not saying that people should start taking drugs even though just about everybody else used to take drugs. Uh, go like. Uh, I did a game called Build Some Art Game on the Amiga, and there were two tunes in that. And I fucking hate them. Oh my God. Honestly, those are the ones I wish I could go back in time and do again. Because I, I see videos on YouTube I'm like, oh no, don't play that level. Oh, please not. Oh, it's dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Yeah. And one of them is the first one in the, in the first level of the game. Oh. Thank you guys for your honesty. <coughs> Hands up, Sam. He wants to ask something. Um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting with the games was uh, the, the, in terms of the tracks obviously is that um, when they were written obviously because as you say the, the tool set wasn't well, there wasn't much of a tool set as such and it was almost like a sort of a, a half coding exercise a half uh, musical um, you know journey um, how did those skill sets cross over to, 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 to get you to that point where you were able to do that because I mean, it didn't even occur to me until, I was used to hack about with it like a lot of people, and I used to rip my best tunes out of the games and things. And you, it's only when you look at the code and you, you see, and you think, wow, okay, this wasn't just music, this was code as well. Um, and it, it was a question I always had, but I didn't think I'd ever get the chance to ask, ask the question. But how did you get to that point? Because obviously, you tend to be either a technical kind of person, you might love music, but you might not have the, you know, the, the knack for it. Um, you have, you've got to be a musician at heart, and then those people usually aren't all that technical, they're more artistic. So I just, I was always curious on how those two worlds merged for you in each case, and, you know, how did you come to that, that place where you were able to do this kind of stuff? Well, f for me, it was always trying to stay on the edge of technology all through my career. Um, I mean, it started with the, you see what Rob had done with his new tune because he was always improving his driver and getting better. And we get a copy of it, we'd slow his music down and see how, exactly how he was creating that kick drum or the snare drum. And then I'd go uh, find my programmer friend and beg him to please make my music driver so I can do these little things, change sounds every 50th of a second and stuff. And it's, uh, it, you just apply that logic and keep going from there, tr trying to stay on top of it. Even these days with all the new technology and digital audio manipulation and stuff, being able to uh, just tighten up vocals by hundreds of a second and stuff. It's, uh, but, but your resources are much, much more available. Oh yeah, we have great tools. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Not, I mean, compared to what we had, we're typing stuff in a text editor back then. I came in after the Commodore 64, so I didn't have to do that, but I had a natural interest in programming anyway, so I was doing both side by side. And ironically, there is a book out, and it's called The Code of Music, and it's about a little girl's journey who combines both of those skills. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so it's quite, quite a the unique... Music. Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> I was always uh, a musician first, and uh, a, a lot of uh, experience playing and writing, and um, I also um, was very, very good at math and physics when I was at school, and so the programming, that side of it came fairly easy, um, learning <coughs> all the binary and all the coding, so it really wasn't t uh, that difficult. 
Yeah, I'd always had an affinity with computers, but always had an affinity with music as well. Um, and I, I had the benefit of being in the Amiga era, not the C64 era. So I didn't really have to do any assembler or anything until I was in the Amiga area, and that did come about. I mean, one of the very early games I did, which never got released, I did a bunch of sound effects, and I sent the sound effects to the programmer, and they said, well, how do we play them? And I was far too proud to say, I don't know. So I went away and learned how to program, and uh, wrote a play routine for the sound effects in, and then sent that over to them. And yeah, I'd always wanted to program, but I just never, I never, it, we didn't have an internet, so I had no way to, to learn, really. And it wasn't until I was surrounded by people and programmers and things that I could at least check that I was doing the right thing. Uh, and so that, that really opened the door then. I've done loads of programs since then. But I'm always a musician who, can, who happens to be able to do other things. That's the way I see it. Thank you. Um, let's, oh, go on. We've got another question down there. Let's take that one. Hands, hands, hands. Um, so this is a question for everybody. Perhaps we'll go with Rob first, with due respect, Rob, in case you forget what the question is by the time I've finished saying it. <laughs> so it's Saturday morning. Picture yourself, you're in Tesco's, you're doing your local you know, bit of shopping, you're in the frozen aisle, lid opens, and you're trying to choose between the value brand and Captain Bird's Eye and whatever. And all of a sudden, one of your songs comes over the music system, let's say it's Commando or whatever. What's your reaction? And then perhaps we can get the view from everybody else. If one of your songs come over, comes over the in-store music system, do you, are you thinking, yes, I've made it, I've arrived? Or what are your thoughts? <laughs> After that, I think I'd just probably collapse. <laughs> Um, I, something did uh, happen that was a little bit weird once when um, I was, uh, I think I was in Sweden or somewhere and a commercial came on and it was one of my music was in the background and I thought, what the hell's going on here? I've no idea, but it's never happened in Iceland or, <laughs> or Aldi or somewhere, you know, as far as I know. Special Swedish video stand. <laughs> 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 I think I'd jump up and scream. I think it would be uh, great. Um, the nearest I've come to that is the Desert Strike loading music was used by a company for their on hold. <laughs> <laughs> I kept on hanging up and ringing them back again. Put me back on hold so I could hear the music again. So, yeah, that, that was quite good. But yeah, I'd, I'd be happy with that. I did have a surprise one once. I was uh, driving down the road in Seattle, and uh, a, a tune I'd written and sent it. It was, in, it was an industrial radio station. They do this show one hour a week, where they play heavy industrial music. And I'd been writing the music for this game uh, called Kill Team. The track was called Hatred, and I'd sent it into them, and they actually played it on the radio. And I had no idea this was going to happen. As I'm driving down the road, I almost crashed my car because I was so excited. <laughs> it just blew my mind. I think my first thought would be, what is wrong with them? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that doing on the airwaves? That makes no sense whatsoever. Not least because most of the games I worked on sold about two copies. Because I was always the unlucky one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, later stuff that I've done, oh, I did, there's a possibility that I've done any early stuff, that would be, yeah, that would be a, a, quite a shift in reality, I think, for that to happen. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Um, right, so my next one. Um, this may have been asked before, but I, I don't think I've ever been lucky enough to hear the answer to the question, so I'm going to ask it. Um, so I know about my own feelings at the time when I was writing the sit tunes that I was writing, but I'm also interested to hear what the feelings are of these guys for their own music. When you were writing your music, at the time that you were writing that music, what were your considerations about the longevity of that music? How, lo how long did, in your mind, did you think it would last? And did you ever think it would last like 40 years in some cases, <laughs> yeah, and 30 years in others? I, I thought it would last you know, a couple of months. I mean, the game, a, a period for a game cycle was two, three months, then it'd been a bargain, but I mean, I had no idea 40 years later, in Brazil, listening to orchestras, play my music for God's sake. 
I, I was just so overwhelmed to be part of the industry that I didn't even look past what my next day was. I just kind of just got on with it. And, and it's here now, because you guys are all here fleeing on the rooms. <laughs> so that's great. I, I thought, like, I agree with Barry. I thought that the games, one di one pound ninety nine, Master Tronics, for um, you know, these games would be last a couple of months, and then they'd be put in the in the in the bargain bins in uh, garages, and uh, they'd be forgotten about. So you know, you do like thing on a spring, and you get hundred quid, great, you know. And um, basically, you do it. You know, next gig you do something, and uh, that was like four hundred quid. You think that's going to last like two months? And you know, I'm thinking, well, as long as it keeps going, I'll 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 do it as long as it lasts. And that was the thought, you know. And then you're thinking, well, after that's gone, I'll have to think of something else to do, you know. <laughs> I think for me it was basically the length of time was up until the magazines reviewed it because while I'm doing the game I, I was totally absorbed in that game so I'm doing the best I possibly could for that but then certainly in those days there's no internet you get no feedback whatsoever it, you, the only thing you've got is the magazine yeah. reviews so you wait for them to come out and you hope that they say it's good and then that's it and then you move on to the next game and then that's it really yeah, no, no real concept of longevity. You hope people like the game, you hope that they play it for a long time, but you, you don't really think about that. It's been released, you see if people like it, you move on. And for the record, I'm, I'm kind of in bed with Barry and Rob on this. I think for me, when I was writing at the time, you were thinking, yeah, three months, and then it'll be in the bargain bin, and three months later, it'll be in the real bin. Um, and so I had absolutely no idea that this many years later, that the music would stand the test of time and that there would be anything like the scene and the community that exists. So, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's my kind of two pound. Um, let's take a couple more from the audience and I've got one last question. Thank you. It seems to me in my imagination that there was a bit of a step change during the time the Commodore 64 was out in that it started with the basic idea that you're translating a piece of music, you've got three voices, four waveforms, and you try to translate something that could be played by that many instruments. And then all of a sudden we were getting tunes like the Ghosts and Goblins theme or Euridium that were completely different and were not something you would ever hear played by an orchestra or whatever. Was there any big step change in technology or in programming technique that allowed that to change to take place? Well, the, the master there with his uh, arpeggios and squeezing in little bits of white noise for hi-hat sounds really, uh, yeah, it duplex. It, it just allowed you to get so much more in there. I mean, that was a big change because the very early games, you know, you'd have a, a really crap <coughs> version of like a fur release or something. The, um, the earliest stuff that uh, I had on the Commodore was dreadful, yeah, uh, because it was done by the programmer who was trying to like figure out what the notes were, and you know he got half of them wrong. <laughs> and they, you know they have no concept of time, and so you'd get like some half-baked version of a of a two-part bark invention, or you know like you say some hacked version of a fair release, which you know. Sounded, yeah. like the, sounded like the program had been taking too many drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, my, my thought was, God, there has to be an opening for somebody who, are, who can at least get like 70% of the notes correct and, you know, get something that's reasonably in time. So that's, that was like my thought. And so, you know, um, <coughs> Things like Action Biker was like very, very simple, you know, and then um, later on you start to develop more kind of interesting techniques and start to be able to think, well, how can I use a ranging to try to like maximize the number of things I can do on one voice to make it sound a bit more like, you know, sound like a fuller sound. Well, it wasn't just that either. I mean, you were doing things like, uh 
the way you arrange your music, you know, with the verse and chorus and then having a coda on the end. So, yeah. I mean, programmers well, would never think of doing that. Yeah. Well, my, my thought was um, people are going to be playing this music, you know, they're going to hear it an awful lot. So, you know, I can't just have like A, B, A, B. I've got to have like, you know, like six different sections and try to make this thing, you know, at least six or seven minutes long. Otherwise, it's going to drive them up the wall. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it still probably did, you know. <laughs> People used to say to me, what do you do for a living? Oh, I, I do like, like music on games. And they used to say, well, you're that fucking guy who does them awful beeps and boops. <laughs> But then I used to say, no, that's not me, I, I just write the code. <laughs> so as we already established, I was too young to do Commodore 64 stuff. Um, but on the Amiga, it, it, it wasn't quite the same because we could play samples, so if you had good samples, uh, then you could do something that sounded good. But even samples are really hard to come by. I couldn't afford a sampler, so it was just a case of ripping stuff out of other games and demos and things like that and, and making the best out of it. But even then, yeah, the, it was still a case. I mean, most of the games I did, I had to use three channels because uh, we had to have one percent of effects, and it was still a case of trying to squeeze as much as I possibly could. If you look at some of the Pro Tracker tunes I did, there's not an empty space in any of the channels. It's just how much can we squeeze in to try and make it sound like more of what it is. So I think it, it's to do with that program of mind as well. You know, when we're not thinking in terms of music score we're thinking in terms of these processing steps and what can we do each of those steps to fill out the, uh, the frequency spectrum with it. <coughs> Similar with me, I, I wasn't from the 64 time in that sense so my story is the same with the Amiga and the question that was asked earlier about um, having more technology if that helps with the creativity I found it made it worse for me initially because I was like a child in a sweet shop with all these sounds and it becomes difficult to Think you can overcrowd the music and just want to put everything in it, like making a meal. We have to decide what ingredients to put in and not overwhelm it with too much salt, for example. So, mine is the same Amiga situation. I'll just add a little gem um, from the from the kind of playing in bands community, which is all the gear and no idea. <laughs> um, and sometimes that's the case. Um, and for me, I think the biggest strength in synth music is your own arrangement. You know, that, that something that people can gravitate to, irrespective if it's being played five, six, seven, eight times, if it's a catchy tune, if it's arranged well, you know, if the structure is good. You know, I, I think that really is kind of where we went from that initial single noted accompanied classical music to structured tunes that had melodies and arpeggios and drums. Yeah, but it did take time, but it was great when it came. I'm gonna get, uh, let's have another couple of questions. Let's throw it out again. Uh, I was just gonna ask if there was any particular, particular company that you work for that were a nightmare to work for back <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing electronic arts for one minute. Who wants to go first? <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys got to play Horizon Chase Turbo, um, but when they, when they came about to do Horizon Chase 2, it was an absolute nightmare project for me. Um, the whole team, previously for the first one, they're like, write whatever you want, we're just happy to have you here. So I had a great time writing all these tunes. Well, for the second one, they put it under the purview of the art director and they had a, a whole company-wide meeting where, they, where they, they could only decide on one piece of music that they all agreed on as a style guide. And from that, I was supposed to create 25 different tunes. But any time I tried to step away from that one reference, they were like, no, no, we don't like that. So it was, I found it so difficult. It was really constraining because any, any time you just move in the wrong direction, you'd get an email back saying, Oh, there is just no world that this fits in our game. You know, it's terrible. For me, it was slightly different. When I stepped out of the, uh, the games industry and went over to the mainstream music industry, I found that having a producer over my shoulder telling me what to write and what not to write it was just too much for me. I didn't like it at all. 
and that would have been uh, universal. <laughs> just drop that in there in, in the early years. I wait for a company cleaning industrial machines with trichloroethylene. <laughs> that is the worst company I work for. <laughs> Don't follow that. <laughs> I did potato pig one time. Nightmare. Never did that again. Um, no, I, I, in terms of companies, I can't say a company I worked for, but projects, certain projects were ridiculous for whatever reason. And yeah, exactly the same thing. The team would say, we want it to be like track three on this CD. And so you do something that's like track three on that CD. But it's not the exact track three on that CD. So it's got to be identical in every way but different. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's been a constant frustration with, with people doing that sort of thing. I've got something. Okay. So Rob and I talked about this yesterday. Um, when, we, when we started on the very first Encore 64 project, and I teamed up with Thomas Stanko, whose name, uh, hopefully, some, quite a lot of you know. Um, for those who don't, he's a senior audio engineer for Ubisoft worldwide so the guy is like he's got real chops when it comes to mixing and mastering and, and we all teamed up on this first encore album and danko said to me he said there's a little job going at ubisoft he says um, but i don't think you'll want it you know and i said okay well tell me you know he said well he said it's a piece of interlude music in a particular little bar and I think the guy's leaning a bit towards something like a Star Wars cantina. He said, but what he's actually, I asked him a little bit more, because Danko himself is a musician, so he said, I asked him myself. He said, and the guy said to me, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> to which I very politely said, well, you know, thanks for that, but stick it up your ass." <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's take another one from the audience, and then anybody else come up? Who has that one? Who has that one? Sorry. Fire away, young man. Hi there. Um, just going back to a point earlier where we were talking about um, the longevity. Did any of you guys ever think that in some of these games there'd be a lot of us out there that would just boot the game just to listen to the tune, need the intro running, and then just off the back of that, all the sort of stuff that's come out in recent years where people have sort of reimagined and remastered those tunes. For me, I always, uh, when I wrote a piece of music, I always wanted it to be something that people would listen to outside of the game. I mean, that was my end goal. I mean, secretly wanted to be a pop star, but that wasn't going to happen. You know, but I'm always blown away by the creativity of people that uh, do cover versions I mean, the, the Top Gear music and stuff, there's like 50, 60 videos on YouTube with people playing on accordions and guitars and stuff. I, I had no idea people were going to do that stuff. And it's always mind-blowing you know, to see that creativity. Yep, I agree with Barry. I mean, when I was young and I started listening to uh, video game music, I used to put Rob stuff on loop. It would thrust be my favourite, so don't say it's one of your worst tracks, please. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, as you go on, people start doing that more and more. So it, it became really, really nice to know that people appreciate the music, like what Barry said. I remember going on YouTube and there was a guy with an electric guitar and he was doing a version of uh, my John Madden football for the Amiga and he was having a field day in his bedroom going, wah, 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 going crazy. But it was nice to see the appreciation. So, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, I never thought any of this stuff would last this long either. And uh, I've always been quite blown away by some of the stuff that I've seen on YouTube of uh, people doing stuff. And um, people do some pretty weird kind of versions of stuff and they say, don't you think that's dreadful? And I said, no, I don't, I don't really mind, you know. I'm the guy, like, you know, um, I find it a bit of an honour, even if like some of the other people think it's pretty dreadful. I still think, uh, yeah. you know, I accept it for what it is. And uh, um, the guys like, you know, I find it, you know, humbling that the guys doing it, you know. <coughs> and um, there's such a lot of stuff out there now. It's just quite mind-boggling. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was the person who recorded Think I'm a Spring on tape, so I, I, I appreciated all of that music when it first came out, so I understood that, I mean, surely if I liked it, I'm, I'm my mates as well, then other people are going to, but you'd never expect this sort of thing, not, not a chance. I remember there was, I, I did a PlayStation game, um, and it's a lot of sort of synthy, dark guitar music on it, and there's a YouTube video of someone playing guitar, of, of doing a cover of that, and that's amazing. But he got a note wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think if you think about the way that we've come forward, um, there was obviously the kind of if we say ten years at most of the Commodore sixty four, um, and yet as soon as you kind of turn the millennium, the remix scene appears for the C64 and it, initially it was obviously Sid and drums that was the first kind of amb ambitious attempt to, to, to have Sid music that was more if you go on to something like Remix 64 now Remix64.com and you listen to the, the complexity and the subtlety and the fidelity of some of the remixes on there it's absolutely amazing uh, I mean, I'm no stranger to doing remixes myself. It was kind of my, my reintroduction. Having done my short stint with Sid Music, I didn't really get back into kind of Sid Music again until 2010. But that was in the form of remixes. And with all those wonderful things you had with the digital audio workstation and sample packs and VSTs and no restriction of three channels. And you could make remixes that you perhaps thought the composer would have originally had in their mind before they had to chop it down to three three channels and then go, ah, it's your you know. And I've done that with Fred Gray a couple of times. Um, and and I've uh, been lucky enough to talk to him. Uh, and we talked about Shadowfire as a tune. And he said, yeah, yeah, I could always hear an orchestra with with electric guitars in it when I when I wrote that tune. So, yeah, and obviously out there there's a healthy game scene still, there's a healthy remix scene still, uh, and there's a, there's a healthy demo scene out there still. And it's still, you know, new stuff's coming out every week, every month, and we are still, we are still rolling forward. Just got to time check and make sure I don't run over. 12 minutes. Lovely, okay. Well, so I'll ask my last question and then we'll take a few more from the audience as well. So my last question to each one of you is, what are you doing now? Or if you're not actually doing anything now... I'm sitting here doing Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> In fact, be, before we get to that, let's have a quick show of hands. How many of the people on the panel didn't use drugs when they were writing music? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So what are you doing now? And if you're not specifically engaged on anything right now, what, what do you want to do? What do you want to do next? What do you want to do now? I know what you're doing. Yeah, 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 I'm not doing nothing. I, I mostly write music for kids' toys these days. I mean, <laughs> if, if any of you guys have kids, there's a good chance you've got a product in your kids' room that I wrote the music for. Um, mm. But for what's next, I think I'm, I'm doing a track for the next Encore CD. I took on uh, Wally Bevan's Tetris tune. Remember that epic 27-minute? <laughs> piece so I'm about nine minutes into that and that's that's getting heavy going. So. <laughs> I'm currently at Pinewood and I'm about to be tasked with my first movie in September so watch Yay. this space. Um, <clears throat> I was recently involved doing the orchestral stuff in 2022 with the orchestra in Prague yep. and um, I would um, like to do some more orchestral work um, apart from that um, I've been doing some jazz stuff and um, I've written some uh, saxophone etudes and um, I'll probably write some original sax uh, some original jazz pieces but I would much rather do the orchestral yeah, stuff sure. When do we get to hear these? Well, the two tunes? We're all waiting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I've never left the game industry. I'm still in there. Uh, but I do programming, mostly now audio programming. Um, 
I'll still do bits of content, but I haven't done a full game for, for a few years now. So it is mostly this program. However, outside of the full-time job, obviously, I'm fully doing my own music. Uh, Insidious. Oh, Insidious, I forgot about that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Off. yeah I did that. That was a while ago. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I made a Commodore 64 emulation, which you can get from Impact Sound Works, uh, and run it in your door and do easy sit tunes instead of having to do it in assembler. Uh, and thanks to Rob for contributing to, to that. Um, so yeah, Insidious, I did that. And uh, I'm doing an album at the moment, which I don't know how to market because I'm a 50-year-old man. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll finish that and see how it goes. But yeah, still do music, do programming. Should we take a couple more? Hopefully try and get as many people as possible to be able to ask the questions they want to ask. If you had the time again, and you can't say computing or, or music, what careers do you think, what career paths do you think you would have gone down? I know uh, Rob's going to say pharmacist, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and distributor, yeah. No, no, either a pilot or a programmer, I think they'd pay pretty, pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, zoology, uh, with David Attenborough being a hero as well, and that was uh, my first passion before being forced to piano lessons. So yeah, that's my number one. I don't know if we've got a clue what we're going to get in. <laughs> I did one semester of uh, electronic engineering and it, I dropped out straight away and bored the arse off us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what, probably what I would have ended up doing if I hadn't had like a thing about music because during that semester I spent more time in the music room on the piano than I did like doing the rest of the stuff I should have been doing. Well, when I, I, I did my first few games while I was still at school, so after I left school, I didn't want to go to college or anything because I've already started doing work, but my parents didn't agree. And so they wanted me to go and do some electronics engineering thing to do with <laughs> radar. So it was either that or go to college, so I'll go to college then. And I was doing computer studies, so it would have been programming, I would imagine, if I hadn't managed to get a career out of music. Come on, go through one more. Just at the back, face. Yeah, go on, sorry. Two, two or one? Two or one. No, how many more questions do you want? Um, You've got about eight minutes. Yeah, let's have two questions. Oh, yeah. um, very quickly. Um, Michael Caine famously turned around and said in Jaws 4, I did it purposely just for the paycheck. When you look at your work, is there any ones that have been given to you? <laughs> no, I did this just for the money. Oh, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. God, that's a, that's a tough one. A lot of them were just paychecks. I mean, at Magitech, we used to get phone calls at a Friday afternoon, like, we need a piece of music for this game, and if we don't have it by like six o'clock on a Friday, the game's going to ship without music. So there was tunes that just got banged out in an hour. That was it. Well, considering I didn't write the music for strip poker, that's out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of my career has been in-house, so I, I, I didn't have that uh, paycheck scenario. It was just a wage, which was always a very good one. So I was grateful for that. So they were they were all written with passion. So. Sam Fox Strip Pub. Well, did you get to meet her? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. That was just for the paycheck. And maybe Hollywood or Bust was another one. Well, I've mostly been salaried as well. I mean, I've been freelance a bit. And honestly, when I was freelance, I would have taken anything. Uh, but... Yeah, most of the stuff I did, I, I enjoyed what I was doing. I'd, I'd put, put my entire soul into all of the music that I did, only to have you know, people not really bothered because they didn't appreciate music in games at that point. So yeah, honestly, I, I, I would have done anything as long as music was involved. And uh, yeah, when I was freelance, I would have taken anything as well. One more? I've got some things to say. Oh, go on. Oh, well. <laughs> the, um, one other thing that um, people ask about is, uh, to do with um, you blowing your um, 
height of creativity on something, you know, and it's like, well, hang on, I've got all this stuff inside which is like equivalent to Marla's seventh. I'm not going to waste this on a computer game, <laughs> right? And, and I always say to them, no, that is completely wrong. You've got like this fantastic idea, you use that on that computer game. You don't like think of this thing as being, this thing is like so good part of my creativity that I am going to put it to one side because guess what? That will never, ever, ever happen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you always use like the, the best gem and the best piece of creativity that you've got on for that project and move on. One more. Well, let's take one more. At the back yep. in the green t and the lime t shirt. Yeah. Okay, you got the last one. I apologise, sir. We've already got a somebody in the queue in front of you. <laughs> yeah, uh, as you all probably know, uh, people still do new C64 and Amiga games up to this day. Yeah. Would you consider doing music to one of those, perhaps? Perhaps if the tools were easy enough to use. I mean, th th there's some great tools out there that give you great driver abilities and stuff, but goddamn, some of them are hard to use. I, I think I would give it a bit. Oh, oh, no, not for me. I think it's too difficult to do it 40 years after the fact. You know what? <laughs> 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 well, that's a good point. Yeah, I made Insidious, didn't I? So I got involved in, in all of that techie Sid stuff. Um, but I've never actually done a piece of music on a real Commodore 64. And I probably should, just so I've got one on, on Deep Sid. So, <laughs> so maybe I'll, I will eventually spend more than half an hour on Go Tracker because it's just like a load of numbers. And it seems very hard to, to get past that barrier. But one day, maybe. I think we all wanted to be a yes, really, from more than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. Um, I think we're about done. Um, and we kind of had our hour. Um, so I, I'd just like you to kind of show your appreciation um, for Barry Leach. And for the black sheep of the family who's got no right being on this stage saying these things, <laughs> Dr. Rob Hubbard. Everyone, I know this is going to be a lot.